So hi, my name is Mariana. I'm one of the sea turtle helpers here at Straw. <laughs> and this is Dr. Claire. I think you can see her on the other side of the camera. I'll introduce you, Claire. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know yet, Claire, <laughs> she's a sea turtle veterinarian who studied biological science at Oxford University before she completed her veterinary medicine degree at the University of Bristol. Um, so during obviously this time, she immersed herself in wildlife and exotic medicine, kind of got the little bug there, <laughs> pulling her to study a bit more. So she traveled to varied places um, to experience sea turtle medicine and conservation in places such as North Carolina and Grenada. Um, and then in 2016, she joined as a lead veterinarian for the Olive Ridley Project, uh, where she helped create the first digital hospital in the Maldives, which I guess all of you have heard about it uh, from social media. They're quite active there as well. Um, and then in 2018, Dr. Claire has also joined the Swiss NGO Ocean Care as a sea turtle consultant. And it was through this work combined from both NGOs that she was inspired to found our Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance in 2021. Um, Currently, she's taking her PhD at Oxford University. So she's focusing her research on aquatic wild meat in the Indian Ocean. But it's not necessarily that she's bringing in today. <laughs> she's going to discuss sea turtle first aid and medical management. Um, so if you're joining us live, welcome. Um, please ask all the questions you wish on the comment section on Facebook. Um, or you can always then email us later on if you have anything that you remind yourself later or if you're watching us later. Um, but we'll be basically monitoring these quite closely and we can always ask Claire either throughout the conversation if it's pertinent or at the end of it and we can have a chat. Um, so we're hoping to have these medical series every month as you've been following us through uh, since we first started and this is a continuation for the June talk. <laughs> um, so Claire, welcome. I think now it's been well 109, I think we can start whenever you're ready. Perfect, thank you so much for that introduction. It's really lovely Mariana. Um, brilliant. So I am going to talk to you today um, sort of about sea turtle first aid and medical management. Uh, the talk is sort of it's it's for both veterinarians and biologists that are working with sea turtles. Um, and I was actually asked to give a quite similar talk uh, in December last year in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, and the idea behind it was sort of if you were to come across a sea turtle that needed um, help and had to be found entangled or um, washed ashore, what sort of things could you do as biologists, but as, also as vets, um, that maybe didn't have access to the state-of-the-art sort of veterinary rehab centre or rescue centre. So uh, Mariana gave you a wonderful uh, description of my background, um, so I won't go on any further, but just to note that a lot of my images and uh, videos are taken from the Olive Ridley Project, my work there in the last five years, so just a uh, shout out obviously to the, the sort of um, videos and content that you'll see. Uh, so there are brief summary of the talk today. We'll have a little, you know, uh, chat about uh, how incredible the anatomy and physiology of sea turtles is. Um, and then also, what is it that a veterinarian will be looking for during a physical exam of a turtle that requires help and aid? Um, what you might need as a first sea turtle first aid kit, both in the field and at a rescue centre or rehab centre? Uh, what do you do when you find an entangled sea turtle? Um, handling the patients themselves. Uh, I'll just touch on hook and line removal as being one of the most um, commonly found injuries to turtles. Um, I'll just also touch on oil spill instances um, and then also like the possible veterinary care that turtles can receive at rescue centres um, and then briefly at the end we'll just summarise um, the new exciting things that are happening for turtle for the Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance as well. So why sea turtles? You know, they are an incredible species to work with um, as a veterinarian. They have this incredible uh, hard shell that we, we all know and love. Um, and the shell itself is quite impressive because it is made out of these two layers, the, the fused uh, ribs, the dermal bone, and on top of that, that scoot, the keratin layer. Um, and interestingly, they do have nerves going through these um, through the structure, which means that they can feel pressure. Um, so when you are touching these turtles and, and handling them, they can feel that on their shell. Um, and they are comprised of different bones, so the fused ribs on the top and then these um, dermal bones uh, in the plastron, which are connected with connective tissue. So just to note on how incredible their anatomy is and why it's so perfect for being um, very streamlined in the sea and their beautiful flippers that are just their elongated bones uh, within their flippers that they can then swim very strongly and impressively underwater with. Uh, internally, they're just as impressive. Uh, unlike us, they, they lack the diaphragm. 
which means that their lungs are able to expand to basically the entire length of their, their inside of their body, um, which is obviously very important for their being able to dive and, and their breath holding abilities. They do have a three chambered heart, just like other birds and reptiles, um, and they can also shunt uh, the blood around the body, which I'll touch on a bit later. Um, they have one opening, the cloacal opening, so that's the common um, opening for digestive, urinary and reproductive systems. Um, and like I was mentioning about their lungs, they can hold their breath for up to like an average sort of four hours. Um, it has been recorded up to seven hours um, and they have this incredible ability, efficiency of transferring oxygen to their blood. So just this is sort of, you know, what interests me in the first place, being a vet, wanted to work with these species, how different they were from cats and dogs that obviously most veterinarians uh, get to see. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk now about sort of the actual why, why veterinarians are needed for sea turtles uh, in, in the wild. Um, and the next few slides and, uh, will contain some images that have been taken from these rescued turtles. There will be some graphic images um, and some videos and even a, a video of a postmortem as well. So just to prepare you. So why do we need uh, sea turtles uh, to help uh, turtles in, in, in rescue rehabilitation facilities? Well, unfortunately, a lot of anthropogenic factors can lead to turtles being found stranded or entangled or even floating in the sea. And often that's when uh, humans then need to intervene to try and protect this wonderful species. As we all know, they are mostly uh, endangered, critically endangered or vulnerable. Uh, and so as a wild species uh, in need of conservation, being a medical practitioner is very important to try and keep the individuals alive, as well as you know keeping the, the entire species as a conservation. Um, so being a veterinarian is actually very important for that individual in this case. So when sea turtles are found, they can be found many ways. Um, most commonly for what we see in the Maldives and the Olive Ridley project is this fishnet ghost net entanglement. But also we sometimes find these debilitated turtles just floating um, like this one here on the right. Unfortunately, if they've been floating for a long time, especially in fishing net material and plastic, which floats, they then come onto the land. Um, and so we can often get calls uh, to say that there are turtles found, you know, washed up on the beaches. So buoyancy disorder is another commonly found um, reason why turtles come in to get rescue rehabilitation. Uh, this is an example of an olive ridley that is um, unable to dive. So you can see sort of the attempts being made at the surface, looking down intently, but unfortunately this turtle cannot dive and therefore is unreleasable. And we'll touch on that in a minute about when, when turtles need um, medical care. Unfortunately, uh, turtles often are victims of um, poaching or predation. So poaching events, obviously humans, um, this turtle here on the left was found at a fish market, uh, but also natural uh, predators such as sharks uh, in the wild uh, this Olive Ridley was unfortunately um, attacked by sharks uh, and that happened due to it being entangled in a net and at the surface. So these injuries are obviously quite horrific. So when these turtles are found, obviously usually it's maybe um, someone uh, by the beach or a fisherman perhaps, or in the Maldives, um, someone out on a dive boat or a tourist perhaps snorkeling. What's, what happens next? Well, obviously the first thing to do, like it would do for any animal, would be to assess the animal and see what is the problem. So if it has no obvious external injuries, uh, that is to say that, you know, from, from just looking at it, um, the shell doesn't seem to appear to be uh, hurt, flippers are intact, um, and it's on, on the shore. If it's not necessarily doing something natural to it, for example, like laying its eggs, um, you can actually just put it back in the sea um, and watch to see if it can dive and swim away. And if it is diving and swimming away, then brilliant. Um, you know, there's no need for extra medical care. If it is unable to dive, like that turtle in the video with buoyancy disorder, it's likely to need some medical and further help. And if there are external injuries present, then of course, um, that's when a vet or, um, or a biologist on the beach that might be able to help the turtle can, can come in to play. So we'll talk about sort of uh, the most common uh, reasons why you'd want to actually give to and provide some medical help. Now, the next question is, how do you then assess the turtle and what, what it might need? So just like um, any other um, uh, visual um, exam for, a, uh, for an animal, uh, you have to make sure that that turtle does actually need help. So uh, this turtle on the right is actually Hawaii. And it's a basking turtle that has eaten this red algae and it looks as if it's sort of projectile vomited this hemorrhagic material, but actually that's normal behavior for this turtle. Whereas unfortunately that turtle there on the left uh, is a turtle found in Anglesey, I believe. Uh, in the UK, 
where um, you know a Ridley species should never be in such cold waters, and so that turtle is not where it should be, um, and so it definitely will be requiring help. Um, the other thing to say is that a lot of turtles are often found with this epigoyonta, um, the parasites a burden on their carapace, on their shell, um, which might mean if it's uh, overburdened with this, that it's actually having problems and difficulties swimming, it might have been floating for a long time, and so will require help. Um, and is it showing that normal behaviour? It's obviously a question to ask before moving it. So like if it is laying eggs, obviously don't get involved and leave it be. And then obviously just a quick petitional status. So you can look at the state of the turtle and decide if it might need um, help too. So the physical exam of a sea turtle patient is just very similar to you would do it with a small animal or domestic species. Um, you start at the head end and then you know go through down to the tail uh, and you're looking for very similar things in in this exam so you're starting by looking at the eyes are they bright the tympan and membrane where the ears are set uh, the mouth itself you know if you can obviously want to look inside the mouth um, and um, then go and see the mentation is that mentation normal is it um, is it alert uh, so you can do some reflexes i'll show you some videos in a minute um, and generally just assessing, you know, the, the patient as a whole, just having a really good look from head to tail. So this is an example of um, just seeing the palpebral reflex on the canthus of the, uh, the eyes. So, you know, awake and noticing and blinking, very good. Um, and then the cloacal reflex already, obviously, it's got tone, muscles, it's, it's cramping its tail and being pinched. So another way of sort of assessing um, the patient itself and um, it's very useful to sort of use these different ways to see how, how intact and how um, well the patient is. Um, then obviously, visually, the musculoskeletal system is the most obvious injuries that you can see with the turtle, whether the carapace or the plastron has any fractures. Um, you can check for symmetry and the stability of the plastron when, and carapace when handling the, the turtle. Um, all flippers can obviously be palpated um, if there's practice, if you hear cracking, potentially there might be some, some breaks. Um, and then the range of motion, you know, you're really feeling the flippers, making sure that they can they pull and push back when you're, when you're handling them. Um, and if there's any obvious swellings or fractures. Um, and the same thing with the evalu evaluating muscle tone and strength, you know, is it beginning to push back or pull when you're handling it? Um, and then obviously in water, you can also see if it's able to use that flipper normally or whether there's any lameness or paresis. So again, this is all visual initially, and then obviously a little bit more manipulation with the turtle to see what might be the, might, might be the problems with this animal. Now, um, the skin is very important too. Uh, obviously you can see any damage if it's bleeding, um, if there's any cuts and abrasions, any um, scar tissue as well. Um, diagnostically as well, like for the turtle on the bottom left there, you might want to be suspicious of a skin infection. So you can swab the area and then you can culture that to see if it's got um, a fungal or bacterial growth, for example. Uh, I think it's really important at this stage to mention how um, important taking photographs is of these wounds and injuries, because if you are able to keep them to do wound care, then you can track the changes over time. So daily, if you are having to get them out daily for wound care, Usually at the centre, in the rest centre, we try to minimally hand them when possible. So we do every three days, we do skin cleaning of the wound with iodine. Um, we put manuka honey or flamazine on, for example. And then every week we then divide a bit more deeply, taking away all of that scar tissue. So that bottom right photo there is uh, like sort of deep um, scar tissue that has... Um, just like we would get scabs really, it builds up um, as, as the tissue begins to heal, second intention. So you can remove some of that, um, leaving that fresh sort of pink, almost bleeding slightly um, tissue underneath to make sure that you know, it's not gonna get more further infections and you're cleaning and putting that manuka honey, like I said, um, and flamazine on. So it's very important really to really assess what you can do for these turtles that have these external injuries. Uh, obviously, the, uh, there might be some more damage to the, to the skin itself, if it's been like a boat strike, for example, or an entanglement. Uh, both these turtles here have had very severe entanglements due to fishing nets, so you can see the constriction around um, the flippers in the neck. Um, also, turning the patient over, you know, not just what you can see from the top when they're on their plastron, but having a look on the other side to see if there's any um, discoloration of the plastron as well, because there might be some underlying internal disorders like bleeding, for example. So the plastron not, might not be the same color as, as it should be. 
Um, and then, yeah, I just mentioned that scar tissue, that granulation tissue. So the digestive system, I mean, it's quite difficult to assess um, from a sea turtle due to that incredible shell of theirs. So what you can obviously see is the front end and the back end. So oral cavity, uh, you want to try and get a really good look inside its mouth as possible. This turtle's giving a good example of having a good look and seeing if there's anything down there. Um, the esophagus of a sea turtle is a fascinating, um, and I'll show you a video shortly. Uh, it has these incredible spikes that face down, uh, which are um, to keep food down and water and expel water back up again. Um, you can also check for any sort of trauma, parasites, parasites chronic changes, uh, and physical abnormalities, just by having a look around the mouth area. And again, the same uh, for the cloaca. So um, there are common prolapses in turtles that might have had some um, intestinal impaction, for example, if they've swallowed a lot of plastic and they're restraining to potentially poo. Um, so, you know, both ends are very important to look at. Um, and ultimately, if you have got a rescue a rehab centre, you can use that femoral fossa area um, where those forceps are um, for the ultrasound to see if you can see a bit more internally to give you an idea of, of what, what might be going wrong. Um, and I will talk about um, fishing hooks and line injuries as well shortly. So this is the this is the post mortem video of an olive leaf turtle, uh, and this is the esophagus, and that's the trachea on the left that I was just holding. And so these are these incredible spikes that allow for fish and anything else that's been eaten to go down, uh, and then not come back up again. And then because it actually can constrict and expel um, the seawater, so that the turtle's not consuming too much seawater as it feeds. So really, really cool adaptation uh, of these animals. Uh, and it's quite surprising the first time you ever see it. Um, so during a post-mortem. So cardiovascular system, uh, unlike cats and dogs, you really can't you hear the wonderful heartbeat uh, just with the stethoscope alone. So we use a Doppler here, uh, a normal uh, um, beat, sort of 20 to 45, um, but it can drop significantly during surgery. So all the way down to sort of three beats per minute. Um, they had this also, I mentioned earlier, this ability to shunt their blood. Um, they use that as a, a diving um, strategy, um, but also during surgery as well. It's important to note that because they can do this, it also affects where you would actually place the drugs. Uh, so to head in, um, because they might not be able to then circulate the blood um, as, as efficiently. Um, debilitated turtles might breathe more frequently or more infrequently. So it's important to really look and count breath rate as well. Um, and as mentioned, without the diaphragm, more, um, more negative pressure is actually required to, uh, to breathe and to expand those lungs. So when you're doing surgery or handling turtles on land, you'll actually see the shell um, kind of expand as they're breathing and, and the flippers will also sort of use the musculature to, to breathe. Um, and they have sort of a more forced um, expiration follow rapid inspirations and inhalations. So it's very important just to keep an eye on and, and, and have an idea of what is normal and what is not normal. Um, and their lungs themselves have this incredible structure to their parenchyma, to the tissue. Um, it's slightly more uh, structured than our mammalian lung. Um, they can't cough or gag. Um, so any aspiration, they might, if they swallow water, they might actually breathe water in as well. So what you want to listen for is like a normal breath. So if you hear any crackles or increased respiratory effort, it's quite likely that there might have been some um, swallowing of seawater or uh, an underlying infection. Um, so also uh, tracheal obstruction, which I'll show you as well as to how you intubate a turtle. So that's just something to keep an eye out of. So wheezing, gurgling, any open mouth posturing uh, might be abnormal to that patient. So this is the video of just before we were about to intubate this patient, you can see the amazing glottis there at the base of the tongue, they're opening up. Um, so that's where we'd obviously put the UT tube. Um, and again, you need to be careful not to uh, inflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube because they have continuous rings, so it can result in damage to the trachea. And also not to have it too long uh, endotracheal tube because it does have a short bifurcation. So the trachea then goes into both um, lungs. So just another thing to be wary of if you were going down the line of um, anesthetizing um, these animals. Um, the urogenital tract, like I mentioned, that one hole, one opening. Um, it's very important to take a look at this when you're doing the overall assessment of the animal. Um, you want to palpate to make sure there's not any foreign bodies there. As we all know, sadly, plastic is a huge problem with many of our turtles that we see in rescue rehabilitation. And sometimes we can actually find not only fishing line, but actual chunks and big chunks of plastic. 
Um, if a turtle is able is pooing, it often happens whilst you're handling them out of stress and in response to being out of the water as well. You can actually use that faecal sample to do a parasitology check, check a, um, on the health of the animal that way too. Um, and unfortunately, like I mentioned earlier, if there is um, a prolapsed cloaca, you want to um, obviously keep an eye on it for any ischemic tissue and it might require surgery. So that might also be a more long-term medical managed case. Um, sea turtles obviously cannot be sexed until they reach adulthood just by looking externally alone. Um, and that basically means that once they do reach maturity, their tail length will increase quite significantly if they're males. And this can be seen by the different lengths here with the different species. So the nutritional status is also something that you can visibly um, can see. So um, it can be subjective, i.e., you know, a very skinny turtle compared to a very overweight turtle. But you can also use some quantitative measures, which I'll briefly touch on. So with the emaciated turtle like this hawksbill here, um, the carapace and sorry, the plastron was very concave. Uh, there's basically absolutely no fat underneath that plastron, as you can see. Um, and the eyes look quite sunken in, uh, which also is sort of a sign of de dehydration. Um, and generally speaking, if there's just very little fat stores, if the flippers appear to be very bony, you can obviously subjectively say that's a very skinny animal. Uh, and the reverse is true if the plastron is very flat or even extended, if the, a lot of fat stores sort of go on the shoulder and neck area, um, and also sort of that you yeah, have the convex plastron, um, as opposed to just sort of a normal uh, turtle too. So you can have a range of sort of between um, your body condition score. Uh, and then obviously depending on its body condition and if it is in rescue rehabilitation and its feeding protocol is dependent on what the weight and size of the animal is. So usually in rehab, for example, we will feed our turtles anywhere between one and 3% um, of our daily weight. And my uh, pods have just finished, but hopefully uh, you can stop hearing. Um, um, I'll just carry on talking if that's okay. Um, Sorry. I don't know whether they can hear me here or if it's on the laptop. Um, maybe Marianne, can you let me know? Yeah, you can hear me fine, okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right, if they do die, I'll just take them out and then we'll go from there. How's that sound? <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know when it does die out. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm trying to look for the case, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going for as much as we can. Um, so the morphometrics, uh, like I said, you can obviously say, okay, the body condition of the, sport of the animal is sort of um less or more and depending on one to three one to five or the body condition score as well um and that gives you an idea of like what you're going to feed it if you're feeding it in rehabilitation or if it is very severely skinny and needs to stay into the rehab or if it looks an adequate weight to be released now going back to the sea turtle first aid this is probably um what i would suggest um, most centers or most biologists have on hand if they were coming across turtles and um, that might need help um, I've just left it there, obviously take a look. Um, um, obviously this recording will be online afterwards, so please, you know, might, might be useful later. Um, what I was gonna just mention on this is the camera phone. Most of us now obviously are lucky enough to have iPhones or anything else that can take really good quality photos. Um, and if you are in, in the field and manage to take a photo or a video of whatever it is that you think might not look normal, um, you can always send these photos to anyone from STRA or a veterinarian nearby and just ask advice. Um, at the Olive Ridley Project, we get face call, FaceTimes um, on a messenger, on WhatsApp, for real live you know, rescues to see if that turtle might need to come in or not. So what to do if you find a turtle that you have decided definitely does need to have some assessment done and some medical care. So do provide that turtle with shade, try not to keep them in direct sunlight, um, avoid loud, no loud noises, um, and, and any contact with other animals that will just increase the stress of the animal itself. Uh, ensure that there is enough space so it can breathe. This turtle has cleverly managed to maneuver itself to like kind of obstruct its face. Um, if it is a very stressed individual, you can cover its eyes, um, but avoid the mouth and nose. And also be very careful, these are wild animals. If they are still quite strong, uh, not too debilitated, they can have a very strong bite and they have exceptionally sharp claws. Um, so just be careful for yourself as well as the animal. Uh, and one of the things that you can do to reduce um, its, uh, its, its, it hurting itself um, is actually to swaddle um, and wrap that turtle in a towel. So uh, the in-water examination is a very important part of assessing the turtle itself. If it is very debilitated, like I mentioned, it might not even be able to raise its head 
out of the water to breathe. And so the last thing you want to do is cause it to drown if it was very weak. So being able to see that the turtle in shallow water is able to lift its head out of water is one thing that should be done. Um, and if it isn't, obviously you can take it out of the water and it can be dried up. Animals can be kept out of the water for quite significant periods of time. And um, they can be wrapped um, in a damp towel, for example, to keep them um, moist. Um, but ultimately, if the turtle is okay and able to breathe, um, that's the first thing that you want to make sure it can do. Uh, and if it's covered in a lot of epiobiota, which we'll talk about, you can also leave it in fresh water. We normally leave it in for overnight for 24 hours. Uh, buoyancy. Then if the turtle can breathe and you're quite confident that it can be left in water, you can move it to a deeper tank and then see if there are any problems with it being able to dive or not. If it is buoyant, you can actually record whether it's buoyant to the front, to the back end, and which side it might be more leading to, um, which might give you better implication for diagnostics later on as to what the problem might be. Um, and also just make a note of how much effort there is required to dive, because over time you might notice a significant improvement and it's quite likely then that that turtle will be recovering from its buoyancy problem. And always, as mentioned earlier, if the turtle is unable to dive, please do not release it. That will definitely need to have longer time and risk for rehabilitation. I think it's really important now to note how uh, useful it is to have good notes about turtles that are being found that need rescue rehabilitation. So anything from obviously the day and time that it was found to location, who found it, uh, the circumstances that it needed to be taken in, uh, the most commonly, like I said, entanglement, uh, bycatch or oil spills, for example, uh, the species, if you know it, uh, age um, roughly, uh, and the sex, obviously, if it's an adult. The other measurements that we commonly take are the curved carapace length and width uh, and straight if you have calipers and then if you have access to scales or luggage weights uh, to weigh the animal or give a rough idea of how, how big this animal is in terms of uh, weight. So finding entangled turtles is something that we deal with a lot at the Oliver Ridley project um, and I think it's really important now just to go through like sort of safety features for both the sea turtle and yourself when rescuing turtles. So basically what we always say is please try not to take, pick up that sea turtle from the net itself. You're far more likely to cause more damage to it by the fact that it's already entangled to this plastic. It's probably cutting into its flippers or neck. And so if you lift it up from the net, it's probably going to cut even more. Um, I think I'm going on to my um, laptop speakers now. Um, so yeah, it still works OK, so that's good. <laughs> Clever laptop. Right. So ideally, um, if you find a turtle in a in a, a net at sea, um, ideally you'd want to get uh, rescuers to take the turtle out of the sea as soon as possible and as safely as possible. Um, so you want to sort of ideally lean over the boat to try and disentangle that turtle and bring it onto the boat. But obviously, if that's impossible, if the net is massive, then we say at least two rescuers in the water at, at one time so that one rescuer is keeping an eye on the rescuer itself and the other rescuer is disentangling that turtle. Um, I can't stress this enough. Obviously, we know that turtles breathe air and that they can obviously um, have problems with with um, um, breathing in water um, so if you were to trying to like move them in the water they might be more likely to to breathe in water so it's on one of the disentanglers one of the rescuers can at all times lift that turtle above um head above the water it'll just prevent that turtle from breathing in water and obviously you know if you don't turn the turtle over in the water because obviously its head will then be underwater um, if it is on shore and it's obviously safe away from from breathing in that water uh, but it has got very deeply um, constricted wounds to the flippers or the head it might be something that you then want to be careful about as to how much you take that net off that turtle because sometimes the net itself can actually be preventing blood loss because it's actually constricted so tightly that it's no longer um, bleeding so that's one thing just to be um, careful of so you can remove the net but not so much so that then it then starts to bleed um, I think we were just mentioning about this personal safety in the water. Um, so if it's found entangled at sea, please ensure your safety first. This is an example of a rescue of a ghost net and sea turtle. Um, so just thinking about what I was mentioning earlier, how could this snorkeler have been safer? So obviously having the additional person in the water to help them. And then how might this turtle be helped further so that second person could also hold that turtle from underneath to make sure that the turtle's head remained above the water. So remove the net carefully 
Um, obviously, please don't leave the net in the sea. Um, and if you do get ghost nets, you can actually report um, ghost nets on the Olive Bridley Project's website. Um, and like I said, if it is deeply embedded within the skin of the turtle, don't cut so closely that it might then require, uh, it might bleed further. So you can dampen the towel, let's see, water's fine, and then wrap the turtle in the towel, like swaddle it like a baby, um, which prevents the turtle from causing its harm to itself and to you. Um, and also then think about, right, do you have somewhere that it can be sent to? And if it does need to be sent, uh, we obviously always recommend an enclosed box with air holes um, to be sent um, to the rescue centre. And then also care when handling them. So when they are going from the sea onto land um, and you're moving them around, um, especially for those very severely any, um, tiny skinny turtles, they're chronically debilitated. Um, they can be so, so skinny that those dermal bones I mentioned on their plastron can actually um, lacerate the vital vessels, oops, sorry, such as the, um, the heart and the lungs. So you really want to be careful when you're handling these turtles not to just pick them up um, too carelessly. Um, and also towels can be used to sort of give extra support when they're being moved. Um, so using um, the method of sort of restraining their flippers um, and also under the, under the carapace and plaster on itself. Um, we always recommend that if the turtle is more than 10 kilograms, it should always be carried by two people. Um, so that's a kind of restraining on the left and then picking up the turtle. So one hand on the front under the uh, carapace and one hand at the back and then two people lifting together. Communication is always key. And then obviously if it's a smaller turtle that you can handle by yourself, you can still restrain the flippers from flapping um, and then you can hold one at the front and one at the back. So this is an example of a swaddled turtle being held two by two people, uh, one at the front and one at the back. And then this is an example of a turtle that I was going to briefly discuss its clinical case with you. It was in the Maldives. It's an olive ridley entangled in a ghost net. So if you're watching the video, how we're disentangling this turtle, obviously it's out of the sea. So it's not a problem with it um, having any aspiration. We're taking that turtle off, uh, the net off the turtle, sorry, with a sharp knife um, and turning it over. So. This is one of the first rescues that I actually did in all these, and I use it as a training video as to what we could do to do things better in future. So obviously we have one person sort of helping and one person disentangling it, but we could have done something a little bit better, which was um, the, the helper who was actually part of the boat crew actually had his, his foot like stabilizing the turtle, uh, which obviously we wouldn't want to do. And then also, if I play it again, he's um, one, when he's moved the turtle upside down to help, he's actually holding the turtle by the flipper and not at the uh, shoulder. So that can actually cause more injury. If the turtle's already quite badly damaged just there, um, you could actually break its uh, bones just by handling it like that. So you want to make sure you're never handling uh, flippers at the extremities. You want to always hold them nearer the body itself. And then obviously better communication. So I could say, please, can you do it this way um, in future? So this turtle is actually a lovely example, um, and I will go through its sort of surgical history and its ultimate release. So before I do that, these are some other examples of handling. So on the left, I would say it's probably likely that turtle's roughly more than eight kilograms. It might be better in future to have two people hold it. Um, and for example, the turtle on the right is a juvenile, but it's a sort of an action shock, so it will be flapping. So it might be better to actually try and restrain the turtles to try and limit the amount of movement the flippers are doing um, in, in future. So the Olive Ridley Project has a wonderful resource, it's free, um, and it is um, a code of conduct as to how to rescue and um, rehab, arrest, sorry, send sea turtles to rescue rehab um, and what to do with ghost nets. So if you haven't already had a look, please feel free to look at their website and download these code of conducts. Um, I'm going to talk about hook and line removal now as well. So this is quite an important um, thing to note that um, if it's possible to remove the hook, please do. Obviously, if it's external and it's relatively easy to do so, then you know you can remove the fishing hook. Uh, it's best to move the hook the way that it came in. So you want to cut the hook when you can and then feed it through in the same direction that it was caught. Um, and if there is line and you can see it um, and it can be removed easily, then you can. But if you feel that the line is actually already too far down and you can't gently remove that line, you can cut the line as close to the hook as possible, remove the hook, and then hopefully that line will actually then go through the system of the turtle naturally and actually expel itself. 
Um, otherwise, if it's possible and you are next to a re rescue rehab centre that can perform surgery, a surgery might be required to remove hook and line. So it's very important not to pull on that line if it's not coming, because obviously the intestines and the gut can kind of concertina um, and cause more damage to that turtle. And just the same reaction for if it's coming out the cloaca. Um, so yeah, that's the main thing to say about hooks, really. And these are some examples of hooks uh, that might be more easily removed than others. And if not, they require surgery. That was in Lampedusa, which will commonly see um, hook and line injuries. And this is Costas's photo of an adult green with that line coming out of his tail. So if that line wasn't coming very easily when being pulled, it would not be recommended to pull that in case more damage was done to the turtle. Oil spills don't happen too frequently, especially not with us in the Indonesian. Um, so we haven't had to deal with oil spills yet, but oil obviously acts as an irritant, um, both to the mucus, the skin, the eyes, mouth, lungs, and digestive tract if it's swallowed, it's toxic. So the most important thing would be to remove as much oil as possible from any turtles that you find. Um, and that can be done um, by using, I'll tell you about sort of like just detergents um, in a minute, but uh, it's quite important to know how much damage that oil can do. So I've just got some information here um, about the fact that obviously covered in, in oil can lead to exhaustion and dehydration, the oil can heat up in the sun, uh, which can cause the turtle to heat up too much. Um, and obviously it can just impact the heart and lung functions as well. So you don't want that turtle to be used too much warm water when you're cleaning it. You want to keep it at within five degrees of the turtle's temperature. And liquid, like fairy liquid, for example, a washing detergent can clean that oil off. Uh, and it's very effective at removing the oil from the body. And if you can see it clearly has been ingested or in the mouth, you can use some oil, um, vegetable oil to remove from the mouth. And even actually um, mayonnaise is used to sort of like flush it from its system. So that might need some further care. It might have been like that for some time. So it might need antibiotic therapy if it's indicated. Um, whereas activated charcoal is not indicated um, in, in this use in sea turtles at all. So it's just trying to get the emulsification agents to remove the, the oil when possible. So most of these situations that turtles do find themselves in, um, these boat strikes, for instance, or ghost net injuries or um, fishing hooks, they might require some level of monitoring. It won't be a quick wound care, sort of pubidine iodine, you know, uh, wipe and clean and off you go situation. Sometimes, most of the time, unfortunately, um, these turtles require rehabilitation. So if it is possible and there is somewhere where can they can go to receive that care, that longer care from the veterinary professional. Um, it's really important um, to, you know, do, do as mentioned, which is that really useful record keeping to see how they're progressing. Um, most turtle patients will require at least two weeks of monitoring. Um, and if they are on antibiotics, anywhere from six to eight weeks, if not longer. Um, and obviously, if they're not able to dive, it might take even longer. I think the average time that a turtle will spend at the Oliver Ridley project is about three months, just to give you an idea of how long rehabilitation can take. And ultimately, if a turtle is ready to be released, it will be showing these behaviours. It will be able to eat normally, it will be able to swim normally, and that means diving too. And ultimately, usually most of the time, that turtle will spend on the bottom of the tank. So these are just a couple of examples of... Um, um, uh, sorry, um, modern or bigger facilities. Um, these are the ones that the Olive Ridley Project currently have on the left. Um, um, and also veterinary facilities, you know, for turtle medicine is coming so far uh, from cataract surgery to using MRI CT scans to get the best diagnostics available and having these larger um, tanks to actually look after sea turtles if they need longer term care. Mm -hmm. But you don't necessarily need to have the most up-to-date uh, clinic available either. A very uh, basic equipment can do a lot to help diagnose um, and treat our turtle patients. So initially the clinic in the, in the Maldives started like this, um, and now we have access to x-ray, ultrasound um, and endoscope, which I'll talk about briefly. So blood work is very important too. Uh, just by taking a small blood sample, you can find out how anemic the animal is and check for its blood uh, volume, blood pack cell volume. Uh, you can do a glucose test, check the total solids, you can do blood smears using a microscope, and you can do a white blood cell count to see if it is fighting off an infection, for example. Um, rehydration therapy is very important. This is where um, I should note that turtles can often not have to eat for weeks to months. So rehydration is more key than trying to get the turtle to eat immediately. So fluid therapy daily until the turtle is eating is definitely warranted for a debilitated sea turtle or those found in nets, for example. So we give a maintenance dose of 10 to 20 mils per kick per day. 
Um, and I'll just briefly mention that I think a lot of like um, vets might be concerned that the animal might not be eating for a few days. This isn't too worrisome. It's a wild animal that then kept in captivity can often not cope initially very well with um, being restrained in, in a tank, for example. Um, so we don't tend to worry too much about a few days, even up to a couple of weeks, um, if, if the turtle's got a good body condition score before we start force feeding. And we don't tend to force feed at all. One of the things that we can do is place an esophagostomy tube, so a feeding tube, uh, which means much less stress, much less handling for sea turtles. And it's quite a simple surgery procedure if you have a rescue centre that um, and a veterinarian that will perform that. So um, just to say fluid therapy is probably the most important thing that you can do um, initially at a rescue centre. And you can treat with dextrose as well, so if they're particularly hypoglycemic, so with low blood sugar. And then I enter microbial therapy. Sadly, most of the patients we see are immunocompromised in some form or another, and they do receive antibiotic treatments. Um, and like I said, it's a lot longer than a cat or dog or we ourselves would have treatments for. Often it's more like months than weeks um, for treatment. So that means they often are kept in rehabilitation until the course of antibiotics is, is finished. Uh, and even some centers are able to give whole blood transfusions. So if the packed cell volume is five or less, 5%, um, it is possible to use the same species to actually give blood transfusions. This isn't something that we actually currently do at the Olive Ridley Project. I think we've done it once perhaps, um, but I know that obviously bigger um, centers that have more equipment and stuff um, that are trained to do this um, can obviously help that individual with a blood transfusion. So there's many things that can be done if the center is sort of able to do so. Um, and the ultrasound diagnostics, um, this is one of our first machines that we actually had at the rescue centre. Um, and just to give you an idea, it's very useful to look at internal anatomy um, and to sort of get an idea of what's normal, what's not. If there's leg, eggs uh, in production, uh, you could even Doppler and use ultrasound to look at the heart, for example. Um, so it's a very useful um, additional uh, equipment that you can have at a rescue center, just like radiographic uh, diagnostics. Obviously, like I said, there's not much you can see externally from the shell if you want to look at the internal anatomy. Um, so the x-rays here uh, are a beautiful example. Dr. Minnie actually um, annotated these just so that you can see um, from the Olivetri project. Um, the windpipe, the trachea, the lungs, see if there's any damage to those lungs. Uh, if there's any uh, anything within the intestines within that might be blocking, for example, and giving it um, a blockage uh, internally. Um, and then also, you know, the, the bones themselves, are they damaged? Are they broken? Um, so it's very useful to see what needs to be done if it's surgically uh, needed. So back to that rescue that I showed you earlier with Choo Choo. Uh, this is one of the turtles that was um, in a ghost net and both front flippers were badly entangled. And you can see from this x-ray that both um, the humerus were actually damaged by this entanglement. So after performing surgery, um, Choo Choo had those wounds deeply debrided and actually um, yeah, surgically kind of um, fixed by uh, Dr. Claire Lomas, another Oliver Ridley Project vet, and myself. Um, and I think the turtle was with us for about six weeks, six to eight weeks, um, after which it was able to use both flippers really well and had a really uh, positive attitude, wild attitude for a turtle. Um, and that's another example of uh, well, a personality, but also the ability for that turtle to let us know that it was very ready to dive and to, to be released and to go home. So that's the sort of things that we can do if we have access to rescue rehabilitation centres. So enough about the first aid for now. Uh, hopefully you've got lots of questions and maybe we can answer them uh, in, in time as well. But just to give you an update as to how Sea Rescue Alliance is currently doing, um, we now have this uh, ProVet Cloud that has been it's a patient management software specifically for sea turtles. So uh, we've actually edited it so that you can put in details of sea turtles patients at your rehab or rescue clinic. So if you are looking to use a patient management software that you haven't already got um, and for free, if you're a Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance member, then please do get in touch with us because it is a really useful tool to keep an eye on patients um, and their treatments. And we've also just officially launched our SharePoint, which is on Microsoft Teams. So if you are a member of Sea Turtle Rescue Alliance, you can have access to this online um, 
rescue centre resource, um, which has clinical guidelines and um, any public resources that are already online, we have um, links to. So there's wonderful things obviously to find on the internet, but it's all within the teens. So you can kind of quickly search the site for it. And um, things like patient intake forms, anaesthetic report sheets, anything that you might need within the rescue rehabilitation. Um, it's also, it's, it's a work in progress. So if there's any information here that you might want to have uh, added to, then please also feel free to, to send in your ideas. Um, or anything that you might want to actually um, publish on the site itself. Um, and also by being on Teams, hopefully we can expand our network and communications between us all and talk about anything that you might want to with interesting clinical cases, for example, um, and request any help potentially um, for cases that you currently have. Um, and it's a way for our members to actually get to know other rescue centres and other veterinarians and other turtle rehabbers um, around the world. Um, so we will have regional meetings and regional places and hubs where you can use this resource um, also for free. So if you haven't done so already, hopefully you're following us on Facebook now and Instagram uh, and I had a look at our website and that's where you can also apply to be a member. So I'm going to leave it there and say thank you very much for listening um, and see if there are any questions. Thank you, Claire. It was a really nice presentation. Trying to see if there's any questions in your chat, which at the minute are not. I can just ask you something though. Um, how long have you had to breathe for a turtle on an anesthetic? Because obviously they can, if they're very debilitated, they can take a long time to metabolize those drugs. So that's when really do you kind of draw the line between continuing to breathe for them? That's a really, really good question. And it immediately makes me think of one patient I had with um, Dr. Claire Lomas, who was the second uh, Oliver Lee Project vet. We had a very strong um, patient. So otherwise we weren't expecting there to be any anesthetic uh, difficulties following the surgery of an amputation. Uh, but her heart rate continued to drop and we were breathing for a couple of hours um, and like the reflexes were getting weaker and we were concerned obviously about losing this patient but we were very frustrated because before surgery we thought she was an ideal uh, candidate so we ended up waiting I think about six hours we we continued to uh, breathe every 20 minutes um, with the ambi bag um, and after about four hours we saw some more tone some more reflex um so we went waited another two hours and then slowly and surely all the reflexes came back um until she was beginning to breathe for herself at about two in the morning um and then by about midday the next day she was back in the tank swimming around normally um so <laughs> basically a very long time some turtles just take longer to to yeah like you said um get, get through um the anesthetic so um, that was quite a frustrating case. Not normally they're that long. Normally you're sort of an average an hour to two hours before they're able to breathe for themselves. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, hi, Joe. So Joe has a question here. He says, at what point do you decide if it is best to remove the flipper or try to save it? That's a really good question. Thank you, Joe. Um, so unfortunately, with our patients that we see in the Oliver Ridley project, it's normally quite... Um, well, it can be quite obvious if the tissue is sloughing, uh, the skin, the muscle um, or multiple bones are exposed. We, there's no deep pain. We can use um, the hemostats to sort of really um, feel if the turtles are being able to feel what's, what is left of the flipper. Um, normally there's quite a lot, an extensive amount of um, bone that's exposed. Um, at which point it's just not a salvageable flipper. But, um, and if it's also, um, it's constricted all the way around um, the bone itself. So there's no muscle or blood supply. It's just effectively hang hanging on to the, to the, to the bone. Um, that's when we would obviously want to amputate. We've had some very deep injuries that have um, been very swollen and has actually, we've left for quite some time because there's still got some circulation there. So it's not sloughing. Um, and with time that swelling can reduce and then that deep pain or pain can kind of come back and movement can come back. So we're quite careful not to amputate when we can, because actually we've seen some incredible recoveries with some deep constrictions. But I think generally speaking, if it's sloughing um, and there's no pain response um, and it looks pretty nasty, is, is that's when we know actually that's a non-salvageable limb. And just out of continuation, I've seen Penelope and Anya's um, questions here, but just to say, if you do decide to keep it on, 
How do you do that wound care? How often would you recommend doing some sort of treatment on that quiver throughout the process? So our team at the moment um, have exactly that case. We have one that's just post amputation and has similar wound care to the ones that we're just sort of salvaging the flipper. So every three days we do a really deep wound clean. So just with um, gauze, iodine, clean the area sort of, and then add um, manuka honey or flamazine. Um, and then similar situation. Um, and then every week we will get a sort of more debriding, deeper debridement. So we sort of see like fresh tissue, sort of a little bit of bleeding underneath that sort of um, scar, scar tissue. Um, and then generally speaking, as the swelling decreases, you'll sort of, you see the flipper being used a little bit more. Um, and obviously then recovery wise, it takes a lot longer. It can be with us for quite some time, but yeah, so we try to minimize, it's a, it's a really, um, it's a balancing act between good wound care um, and not taking the turtle out of the tank too much to stress it. So at the moment it's sort of three days, and then we at the week, so that after the third sort of treatment, we then uh, really do a sort of deeper debridement. Okay, thank you. So Penelope asks, hello, <laughs> hello Penelope. Um, I read once that male turtles have had an, um, they do have an indented, indented plastron, a lot of English words, um, during the mating season. Is this true? And if so, is it easy to distinguish from an emaciated individual using other features such as sunken eyes, no fatty stores on shoulders, et cetera? That's a good question. I think, yeah, and, and tortoises, and I have to apologize. If you've been hearing lots of banging, it's my um, tortoise <laughs> in the tank over there, sort of trying to get out. Um, yeah, they, male tortoises do have a slightly uh, indented uh, plastron, but it's different from uh, like a emaciated tortoise turtle I think that that's like it's quite obvious it's the whole the whole um plaster on is very uh, sunken in and that obviously the entire body looks skinny you know it looks like there's no fats on it and no reserves so I'm not 100% sure but I do think that there is obviously um slight anatomical differences definitely in in tortoises because they're also on land and on top um, when mating so there is a slight limitation but it does it looks very different um to an, a fully emaciated turtle um like that hawk spot i showed earlier um so yeah um it's probably sorry now tiberius yeah. is being quite <laughs> <laughs> so anya asks um you made a point of the spikes of the esophagus facing downward in a healthy turtle but have you ever seen it facing otherwise no i personally haven't um and obviously i knew ever seeing them when during post-mortems so um, if, I think it's the leatherback, um, Max, Dr. Max was saying that if you look down a leatherback's mouth, you can actually see them really clearly. Um, so that's the only time I've actually known them to be sort of visible. But yeah, normally I've just seen them doing postmortems. Yeah, I think the point of them facing downward just to make sure that the food that they ingest does not come up, continues to yeah. go downward. And that's, I guess, yeah. why we've pointed them out. Um, Uzi asks, hi Uzi, um, with patients that are buoyant and impacted, have you been... Um, and have been on maxillose fluids, but with no good results. Would you suggest surgical intervention on those? So I've got two, two answers to that. One, we've not tended to have too many impacted turtles with us at the Olivetti project. So it's not something I'm completely um, have seen that often. Um, but we've recently had a visiting vet, Sonia Miles, out from the UK. And she was saying that in tortoises that she treats, um, this is a and that one of the things you can do is actually sort of cause um, vibration um, and that's something that she really recommends um, and there's certain of the items that you can use that vibrate that you can keep on the turtle uh, that has actually helped move those impactions down and um, so that's just something that she mentioned to me if we were to have impacted turtles in, in future and um, so yeah so a sort of a vibrating um, electric device would help with moving some impactions. So I have yet to use it, but I obviously am intrigued that she uses it in her clinical practice. Yeah, I've seen that used well, the smaller size tortoises in that case. Uh, but uh, I guess you could draw always a turtle on top of a drying machine. Um, let me just get you the next question one second. Um, so this is Rupan asking, Hi, Claire. Thank you for the great presentation. Do you think acupuncture will be helpful for long-term long -term re rehabilitation patients uh, that had carapace fracture along the caudal vertebra and have positive buoyancy? 
So um, acupuncture is, yeah, it's, it's a quite frequently used in, in rehabilitation. Um, Dr. Max specifically actually likes to use it quite a lot. He's been to visit the Ross Olive Ridley Project too. Um, we've basically mostly been using it on those swollen flippers that have been tangled. Um, so I'm not entirely sure about um, other areas, but I know that obviously it's, it's a useful treatment um, in many cases. So it's definitely something that we also do recommend. Just see if anyone else has a question for Claire while she's here. Otherwise, I mean, we can always ask questions as well in the comments section and then we'll always look at them and can always reply to guys later. Um, Claire also has an email yes. <laughs> if you want to if you want to talk directly with her. Um, but otherwise, if you're part of the Citral Rescue Alliance, every time that you would email us, um, anyone from our team can get back to you as well if you have any specific questions. Let me just see. Mm -hmm. Who's laughing about your joke about the not joke about your comment on the vibrator side of things? I shouldn't say the word. Um, also, Mariana, feel free to talk about. Um, I know you've sort of been very key in the um, the Microsoft plat SharePoint platform. So, if you do want to share a bit of more information about that, I just had to cover it very briefly. Yeah, well, it's still a work in progress, as Claire said. So, we have a lot of themes that we're working on currently. Um, I would say, though, if you are with a rescue center that sees a lot of the same type of trauma or disease um, that you kind of came up with a protocol that has been working really well for you. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to add more information um, to the resources from, you know, specific rescue centers, obviously giving you credit for it. We will just revise it, making sure, um, you know, everything is okay. Um, and we definitely would be adding those things in, as well as Claire said, you know, if you have any themes in, in particular that you need to know what to do, um, definitely, you know, ask us about. We might take a little bit to get back to you for now, just because we're still a small team and getting through these items takes a while. Um, but definitely, you know, we want everyone to participate and have a say in what they need, basically, because it's a collaborative platform. Um, so whatever they have at the Olive Ridley project in the model use might not be the same kind of injuries that you would see somewhere else. Um, and so obviously we will be working through those uh, as people let us know how things are going. And for now also just be aware that current members that haven't received an email or have been having issues at going through this trial platform, don't worry, we'll be getting back to you within the next week, um, just fixing some minor glitches there and and hopefully you'll be able to access the platform soon as well. Um, also, on the side note, not on the resources side of things, but we also are creating regional forums, right? The idea is that people within the same region can talk to each other and provide help, I guess, in a pro probably a faster way, right? If you're in Ecuador and you need some help, maybe someone from Colombia or Brazil is a bit closer by um, and understands a bit better your um, involvement in terms of what you have access to and it's legal in your country to use. Um, so definitely we're creating these regional forums. We need some people to kind of take care of overseeing how they are working and creating the teams within the regions. So if you are from a particular region and you would like to kind of help us out, take over, uh, be a bit of a moderator within it, um, you know, feel free to reach us out. Our email is stra, so the S-T-R-A at citralrescuealliance.org. Um, so definitely, you know, email us and we can chat well work to put you on <laughs> which region um for now says thanks for the great talk we don't Thank see any more much. questions no, if, if you do have any more questions manage to watch this later just feel free to write them in comments and then yeah. we'll get back to you um and i'll take the opportunity to say thank you for the olivity project for um obviously providing a lot of the content for photos uh, and on behalf of sea tide rescue alliance thank you all for watching and on ocean care as well for being the wonderful supporters that have um obviously got us to where we are so far and are still continuing to support um the alliance so thank you very much again and thank you all for listening thank you have a good morning everyone and a good evening. Bye. <laughs>